Welcome back, everybody, to an extra special episode of Making Time With. Today, we have an enormously special guest. Honestly, this guy, you have known him probably most famously for his role in The Sopranos. 20-some episodes in The Sopranos is Eugene Pontecorvo. He's done other things as well. He's done filmographies. He's done TV, Law & Order, Blue Bloods. He's been in The Irishman. We're going to get to it all. This is the man, Brooklyn, born and made. There he is, Robert Funaro. Robert! Thank you for the enormously wonderful introduction, John. You are uh, you are welcome. And honestly, it is a complete honor to talk to you. I know we spoke on the phone a few days ago. But it's, this is really an honor. I mean, you, I, I really, truly enjoy your work. Uh, you're fantastic. You've got millions of fans out there. It is, it's an honor to have you here. Oh, thank you so much, John. Uh, Millions, I'm not sure, but of course, we're, Sopranos is a worldwide event, and uh, there's a lot of people who love the show, and that's what I'm really known for. You know? Yeah, for sure, and that's that's kind of how you got. That was your was, it, was that your first big break? Yes, it was. Um, yes, I can um, tell you a little story about that. And me and James, we had done a streetcar named Desire, where I played streak. Uh, I played Stanley Kowalski. He played Mitch. Uh, about eight years prior to Sopranos. And uh, he wound up in L.A. and did True Romance, and, and he began Sopranos. And the third year in, they were looking for an actor to uh, play a particular role. And uh, James found out through a friend of mine, this is eight years later, I was working at Caroline's Comedy Club. He was at a party. My friend Gordon, good guy, my best friend, went up to him and said, hey, if I was you, I would try to get my friend Bobby Fanaro, Dick only Bobby, a job on your show, your hit show. And he, and he said, well, Bobby James, you know, always a humble guy, a lot of humility. He always take the time to talk to anyone. He said, hey, where's Bobby working? What's he doing? Oh, he's at Caroline's Comedy Club. Oh, okay. So James remembered that. And one day I went into work. I was managing at the time. It was my last position there. I started at the door. Um, and uh, I walked down to Caroline's. There has, this is one flight of steps on Broadway, pretty famous club. And, and who's at the bar? But it's James Gandolfini, my friend Jimmy. And then from then on, it was just magic. From 2000 it was, and I've been acting professionally ever since. It's been a rough road up and down, but uh, it was really worth it. If someone was asking me, was it worth it? I said, yes, it was well worth it. James is a courageous man and who had the courage to come down and find me with his driver, Joe Fay, went to a couple of comedy clubs that night. <laughs> he didn't remember Caroline's. And he offered me, you know, he said to me, look, I can get you an audition. Uh, have you been acting? I lied. I said, yeah, I've been acting. Yeah, Caroline's. <laughs> so you have to lie. And I said, yes. And I got an audition, went in to see George Ann Walken, and I landed a role on The Sopranos. And he said, I can't promise you anything. I tried to do it before with a friend of mine. And didn't work out, so I was very fortunate, very blessed to uh, to land the role on The Sopranos and stay on the show for another six years, basically. Uh, you know, three years became six years, and of course, with the off season and stuff like that. So, six great years in my life. Yeah, I mean, and and you you start. I remember. I think our first introduction to you on the show is when well, you smashed little Polly in the side of the head with a beer bottle on the construction site, right? So that was our first. Was that our first? No, it was, it, it, it was when Ralph Seferetto came into, into, into existence there in the show. Ralph uh, and myself and Vito Antifermo, we went to do a job uh, to a basically strong arm a guy. I hit him and I hit him over the head with a baseball bat. Or, or Vito did. I, I don't remember. I think I did. And Ralph, Joey Pants, watches from the car. I remember. Very first episode. Yeah. And then you had, right. And then you had the scene of the construction site where, oh, and then he smashed. Yeah. Yes. That was later on. It was like, yeah. I think that was the second season or the second season I was in. Yeah. Second or third season, maybe. I'm not sure. Well, and then your role kind of got bigger because all of a sudden it was like, now we met your wife. Now we met the kids. Now we met, like, your role I think David Chase or I mean or the writers, they really sort of opened your role up, right? It wasn't just you're just the guy in the background kind of you you now you have a story and obviously you had a storyline in that in that series then. Yep, season three, the first episode. 
I was uh, getting phone calls. Hey, did you know that there, because I was basically into acting then and then casting directors and my management. Did you know that they're casting your wife? Did you know that they're casting this and that, your son? And I said, wow, this is fantastic. They're probably going to open me up here, you know? Yeah. And then I said, uh, well, yes, it was a wonderful thing. And then suddenly I got the call from David. And <laughs> David said to me, I got great news for you. Uh, I, have, I have some news for you. Uh, uh, good news and bad news. What do you want first? I said, well, give me the good news. And he said, uh, Terry went and wrote a terrific episode for you called Members Only. I mean, you're going to get to do everything. Uh, show everyone what you can do, um, and you're going to have a storyline. And I said, that's fantastic. What's the bad news? Well, the bad news is you're dead. That's it. You're dead. So I said, I, I don't care because, I mean, I was really happy that that that, that, that happened. I mean, because if you think about it, I could have stayed on the show like many other characters, and they're, and they're all important. They all do things. But to be remembered for the guy who wanted to get out, who inherited $2 million and you wanted to get out, people understand that. People can uh, relate to that, empathize with that. How many people are stuck in situations? They get a chance to escape, but they can't because they're stuck. So I, I, I thought about that and I said, well, this is a good, good thing. I will be remembered for this guy. And, and I was really happy because the episode did get an Emmy Award for Best Episodic Drama, that particular episode wow. in, that, in that year. So, wow. I mean, although Terry, <laughs> you sound sorry I didn't mention you. It's okay. I have to be mentioned. I was part of something really, yeah. uh, an Emmy Award winning episode. And I was a big part of that, you know, and so that was great. Well, and then, you know, obviously that's a major part of your life, right? That series was a major part of your life. But without you, that, forget it. Without that, it's just, yeah. Well, but Eugene's death brought everything else now, right? It brought, yes. I mean, me and Jimmy, we we discussed this. <laughs> so he said to me, uh, Bobby, if you don't start getting work now after this, I don't know what the hell. I know <laughs> it. Are gonna do? But, you know, it's not so easy. I mean... Um, I believe it was Holden from the New York New York Magazine, which is not a publication. You know, he really gave me a good write up, and then we spoke on the phone. And he said, you know, sometimes you get these roles, and you know, they they, they seem to be like a big game changer, but they're not. What are you going to do? I said, well, all I can do is day but go day by day, and I and I have. You know, it's opened the doors in 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 certain ways, but not fully open. So here we are in the pandemic and I'm writing and I'm trying to, you know, get my own stuff together besides trying to find work, yeah. um, I need to find work. So it's, it's really still tough, you know? Yeah. And I didn't, didn't the pandemic you started, you, so you started cooking right during the pandemic, you started, you got with your mom's recipes, right. And this gravy and the sauce, it doesn't matter. Right. You, you, you started doing all that. No. Yeah. I started building up my blood pressure. Well. <laughs> Kept getting higher and higher until I finally went to the doctor and said, "You better stop all that cooking and you better lose weight. You better lose how much? About thirty pounds." She said. Wow. And I said, "Okay." So I did. I lost thirty pounds and my blood pressure was just checked the other day and it went good for me. Some people, like my friend Anthony from Brooklyn, he got a, had a stroke. So COVID was. Um, a blessing in the sense that we were able to cook and do the things we wanted to write, or, but at the same time, it was a very dangerous, not only COVID itself, <laughs> being, oh, yeah. being, being inside and, and cooking. I did start a cooking, um, attempt to do a cooking show, but now I want to convert that to a, a donation site for St. Jude's. So you learn a recipe and then the, the who people who join up, not a monetary thing. I thought first maybe monetary, but then I said, hey, you know, it's just I really want to just act. And if I did something like that, it wouldn't be so uh, regimented that I would do it for charity. So this is what I'm trying to do. So is it do you have a recipe book out? Can we can we, can we buy it? I mean, where are we finding the stuff on online? I have no recipe book out. People are telling me to get one. To do got- one. <laughs> I have my friend Andrew from the Andrew Frank group who did Vinnie Pastor's sauce. <laughs> and um, 
uh, you know, he's trying to get me to do something. It's just very tough. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, I would, bro, I would think about it to, you know, I mean, it would be more like, uh, you know, we have a very famous restaurant here in New York, uh, called Rayo's. Yeah. It would be a home style family kind of, uh, book. Um, so many re- books out there, you know, and so, you know, I have to tell you a lot of my recipes are, they're stolen. Well, not stolen. They're, sh- they're from shared people that like, uh, David Nagun on Instagram and, uh, and also uh, Bobby Flay. I, I take those recipes. You know, besides my mother's, those are the traditional Italian recipes. Yeah. Like the Sunday sauce or gravy, or whatever you want to call it, still both the same. Those are great uh, things. So maybe one day, maybe I'll jot one down. But it sounds like you have a passion for it. Like you really have a passion for cooking. Oh, yeah. I love I love to cook. It's, 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 it's very, me- you, you meditate and uh, you think you play music and, um, you make people smile. The result is right there, right in front of you. It's almost like the theater when the audience is applaud, applauding. Someone says, oh, man, this is delicious. It's just, that's the greatest applause when you're cooking because you're cooking for others and yourself, but basically for others. Italians, we're in the family, so we're always trying to one-up each other. Try this. All yeah. right, check this out, man. Right. So that was, so that's the thing. A lot of people that are listening that aren't of the Italian heritage, a lot of the cooking, most of it is just, it's really just a feel, you know, we don't get measuring cups and, and it's, a, it, it, it's just what you feel that day. Right. And what you feel in your heart. Yes. And that's, and that's, I think that's part of what makes our cuisine so, so good is that it's not like, no, no, it's a quarter cup. It has to be a quarter cup. It, it, it could be whatever. Yes. It, that's true. Uh, I use my hands, uh, pinches and stuff like that. But when people want the sauce recipe, I try to get exact half a teaspoon of pepper or, you know what I mean? Or, or right. of salt, whatever you want to call it, to try to give them some sort of idea. Sometimes, like you're saying, we'll use five garlics for the meatballs. Sometimes we'll use, there's only three left. Same thing, same result. <laughs> you know what I mean? But there are different things that we do. Like, from, for instance, like my, when I make the sauce, when I turn off the sauce, this is my mother's trick, which she would turn it off, put the pot the cover on the pot, leave it on there. So it pressure cooks the meat and the meat would be nice and soft. The meatballs would be nice and soft when you finally take it out. You got to take it out later. You don't eat it. You could eat it right away, but if you wait, eat it later. So I do my sauces or gravy. I don't want to fight with anybody. Okay. I have enough <laughs> fights already. In the morning, serve it in the evening. Or the afternoon. We like to eat early on Sunday or Wednesday. Wednesday's a spaghetti day for me too. Although it is what it is. Yeah, you know what though? I and if you're not following, I mean you're and he's he's on Instagram. You gotta follow him because you do you do have that little peek into your life about Wednesdays and what you're eating and what's going on in your life. And it's really, really great. And the food looks the food looks delicious. So it's like Good stuff. it's good stuff. I mean it's listen, it's it's gotta be it's gotta be uh a, a, a certain thrill for you. I mean, can I just talk about the Irishman for a second? Yes, yes, let's talk. I mean, I mean that's I mean that's the that's the who's of who's of mafia movies, right? You got everybody in that. What's that like? Tell me, tell me. I mean, that's I mean that's Scorsese. Yeah, that was a wonderful. Well, I work with Marty on vinyl with Bobby yeah. Carnaval, Armin Garrow. Um, and Carnival and Ray Romano. So um, when I got on uh, vinyl, Armin, who had worked with Marty um, in the in the uh, the Boston film, uh, the uh, what was one with Leonardo DiCaprio, The Departed. The Departed. Yes. So Armin said to me, "Well, now that you're in the family, you might be used again because this is the way Marty is. It's, this was the second time mm. he was uh, as a." You could have get a chance to. You tell me when I was in vinyl. So he likes to, because he did the part and then vinyl. So I was just finishing up with Cinna with Jessica Beale in South Carolina, uh, shooting that, which is a nice series too. Yeah, uh, it's a really good detective and uh, um, you know series. Uh, Bill Pullman is great in that. Anyway, um, just finishing that up, and I asked Chris, who was one of the protagonists the main characters. If he had auditioned for Irish, we said, no, not me. I didn't. I said, well, me either. Now it was September when I was finishing up. 
So, I mean, basically, uh, the, the, uh, the bulk of the casting was done. So I said, ah, I don't have a chance of getting in that film. I really would have loved to be part of that. So I go home, and in late September, like two, two weeks later, I get a call from my manager, Eric Faber, and uh, God rest his soul, we lost him. And uh, he said, guess what? I said, what? Uh, Eileen, Ellen Lewis wants to see you and for the Irishman. I said, well, really? I said, yeah. So here are the sides, you know, work on it, go in and see her. I went in and saw her. This is when we were going in in person, which is so much better than this stupid Zoom. And I read these sides for this Johnny. Apparently, when I, when I, when I landed the role, everyone told me the same thing, that they used those sides to land their role or to try to audition for that role. And I was the guy to get this role. I guess there is in Marty's and Ellen when she does things, they use a particular scene to try to a general scene to try to get a feel for the characters and to put them in a certain place. But I was the guy to get the role. So it was fantastic to be um on board on that film. And also of course to work with Robert De Niro, whom I kind of knew through some friends, not personally, but some friends of mine had worked with him. Uh, Richard Bright um, uh, from uh, from The Godfather, Al Neary. Yeah. Worked with him from Once Upon a Time in America. He played Chicken Joe. Yeah. And Ratanya Alder, who had done Coming Home. I mean, not Coming Home, The Deer Hunter. The Deer Hunter. Confused, I know what you meant. At point. Uh, and I get always get that confused. So she was uh, uh, opposite John Savage, played his wife in that. So she knew Bobby. So we had a good talk. I had a good talking point and we struck up a pretty good relationship, which was good because he doesn't say much. You know, so I was happy to, to have him, you know, to, to connect with him. And in a way it worked because of Johnny befriends uh, Frank. Well, he doesn't befriend him. He introduces him to Skinny Razor, Bobby Cannavale. Yeah. And he introduced him into the uh, wise guy life. So, I mean, nine quarters, you know. Do you know when you're on a set like, and I'm probably, you know what, there's probably some similarities between the, the Irishman and Sopranos. Cause do you know, like when you're on set for those kind of things, do you sit around, I mean, can you, can you soak that in and go, this is, there's greatness everywhere here. Like, can you soak that in or are you just so focused on what you're doing? Do you look, look back at it and go, man, that was amazing. Or do you recognize it when you're there? Um, no, because you're so in the moment of, wanting to um you're acting yeah of course you have to kind of throw that out the window uh, all that stuff of being in the moment and or you got to be in the moment as the as the actor as yourself with your actions um uh playing the role so that you kind of put but when i must say when i left the set <laughs> that was a great feeling one of the best feelings of my life saying and i said wow you know when i rapped finally wrapped the whole, yeah. which was great because Marty just, he kept me around. He likes it. It's like a great painter, like, you know, like Da Vinci, he likes to keep the characters. So I would go into work some days, not even work. He just want to, want to, you know, the AD would tell me, you know, just Marty wants to have you around because if they're doing this scene, he might think about using you in the scene, which he did in a scene at the bar in The Irishman. I'm in the background. A few scenes that he used me as, in, in the background. So, he said, whatever he decides to do. And it's great because he keeps people in the family. I saw actors are there were from Mean Streets, from uh, uh, Goodfellas. There were actors who had just one line, you know, and, and Harvey Keitel. Um, I didn't get a chance to meet Harvey, but, I mean, a lot of the little players, he, he keeps things together. He likes to work with the people he likes to work with because they understand. And he just gives you such freedom. It's a bit of a different set from... Irishman with Marty and Scorsese, then with um, with Sopranos. Sopranos and TV, we had to be exact in, in the sense of of the dialogue. It was really being we were hounded, not so much hounded, but we were told to keep it the way it's written. On Irishman, Marty gives you that freedom, like the last take, the take that you see me with Johnny and and Frank Sheeran. 
that was a take that I had improvised a little bit of dialogue. Um, wow. in that take. And that's a take, that free take that one said, just do it, do whatever you want. You know, I'm doing my money. You know, what, what should I do? It's, like, it's okay. Whatever you feel like the dialogue, just go ahead, whatever. And, and he just like, it makes you so comfortable. You know, I, I use my own, he, he knows that we're indigenous, the actors who are indigenous to that area uh, who kind of grew up in that kind of, with that life in that life. Not that I've been part of that life, but I've been surrounded by people there. So he pretty really got, he gets great performances from everyone. So if that answers your question. <laughs> yeah. You know what? And you made a couple of interesting points there that those directors, it is like a painting. Like I'm, you know, let's say you're painting a landscape. You're done with the Browns. Maybe you're on the blues, but dude, keep, keep the Browns around in case I want to add a Brown in later. I got it right here. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yes, absolutely. The truth. And it's great that the Browns who are hanging around, they're still getting paid for the day. Yeah, that's always good. I mean, listen, I don't want to be a free Brown. But like, yeah, I mean, like, because you, you you work on the left side of the painting, and if something on the right doesn't make sense, I right, put Bobby back in there for a second. And, we, you know, and that's 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 a, that's so it's such an ingenious move to do that. And uh, yeah, that's what makes him, that's what separates him and his yeah. work uh, from, from, from many other, you know, the, the, it's all great work. And, I, I've asked Marty, like, did he take this scene from the the some of the um, the still scenes, like in Goodfellas, he he freezes the frame. Yeah. So I asked him, did he take that from Truffaut's Four Hundred Blows? And he he was a little bit reluctant, and he went, Yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. He, he, that's the great thing about him. They say that genius kind of takes from a, others genius and they, and they work it in because it's pr it's a proven it's a proven uh action to do and it, and it works and it's, it's wonderful that it, he keeps the legacy of other filmmakers going yeah it's eternal you know yeah i mean think of yeah think of the directors that follow him and now he's sort of spawned off this whole new sec set of directors because they like what he's doing you know it's and it's a sort of never ending and, and then i would think to be a part of that movie I mean, it's awesome. I, obviously, with David Chase, and I and I watch, I watch. Oh, I, thank you. Well, and so we, that's my next question is. So I watch the the Michael Imperioli, Steve Sharipa podcast. You ever watch? You, you were on that. Yes. Yeah. I think episode twenty four in the twenties. Twenty four. Twenty five. Yes, and I watched. I watched the episode today. It comes out every Monday, and they had, they had the one on Many Saints in Newark today, and yeah. Actors that come on, I think you've mentioned it too. David Chase is is known to like me. It's pretty. The dialogue's pretty strict. I don't really want you deviating from that. And people kind of laugh about it, but they go, he he, he kind of means it. Like he, what I write is what I write, and that's what I need you to say. You know, it's 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 true. But you know, the dialogue um, in plays, you really when you're working with great playwrights like. Uh, John Patrick Shanley, Sam Shepard, uh, even the the classic Arthur Miller and uh, Tennessee Williams. You you really don't. There's no need to deviate from that dialogue. Although, um, it's a questionable. Um, it's a fine line. Yes. But it. I I understand the point of that. Their point that it's written a certain way and they want it. Said as it's as it's written. Although at times, I think uh, acting lent itself, uh, maybe in film more than TV, to uh, improvisation. I think Jack Nicholson said, "Well, if you come up with an idea, do it, and there's always another take. That do it take that you did could be magical. That really, really worked. That came alive. Because what is it all about?" John, is it about people to say, wow, I've been there before like that. That's so true. That's so honest. I feel the same way. I, I can relate to what he's going through. That person is going through. So that's what your, that your objective is to get that. But it's true. I think that plays, TV lends itself to having that same, different, of course, doing acting in a different way, but of course, keeping the text intact. Yeah, no, point, point, totally taken and granted. I, I agree with you. I, I can see it. And I think 
the the job you did portraying Eugene and what he was going through, I think was um was a am- because you can almost feel for this guy like oh my like he's trying to get out he's trying like the nice way to get out do favors for Tony uh, you know wink wink do this and we'll think about it and at some point you just see like the despair like I I, I I'm not getting out of this right and 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 you did such an amazing job of just showing the pain that that guy he's leaving his family and kids it's not like he's a single guy like like Paulie Walnuts or something he, you know what an amazing job that oh, you did for that. that. Thank you very much. It was, it was, um, part of that was, um, the, uh, the terror of doing it for the first time too. Yeah. I kind of imbued that too in, into the role, but it was, a, it was, now that I look at it, I'm really proud of, uh, of the episode as a whole and being a part of it. And also to be remembered, as I said before, I think Brando said, I have the, you know these little things that I, I remember that when he was doing Waterfront, when he was in the car, he kind of gave Kazan a little bit of trouble. I think when he when they did Rod Steiger's take, you know, I could have been a contender, I could have been somebody. Uh, he left, and Steiger had to do his take alone, his close up alone, because he had to go to therapy or something. But besides that little story, uh, Brando had said that you know any actor could have done that, you know, not any, but most actors could have done that role and been very effective because the writing was just so effective. People can relate to being, uh, being a contender that could have been somebody. They lost a chance and, and suppose, and I reiterate with members only the chance to get out, but they couldn't. So. Yeah. And it was, I mean, you can see that sort of, I remember that scene when you first told James Gandolfini that, you know, you had inherited some money, this and that. Do you want to go to Florida? And he said, what are, you, what are, we, what are we, hockey players? Great line. Yeah. There's not, we're not, we don't get out like that. That's not how yeah. this works. Right. You know, and it was such a, such a great role. I mean, such a great scene. And I'm just, like you said, I'm sure I don't have to go backtrack, but working with Jim was, you know, you hear the endless stories about how nice he was, how, I mean, how thoughtful he was. I mean. Yeah, he was, I mean, um, yes. Um Acting is tough, and I think the best way to describe Jim is when he was at the actor's studio with Mr. Lipton, and oh, he, he asked that question at the end, uh, if you were God, yep. what, if you had what, one thing to say to God, what would you what would you say? And James said, um, and in a, the most humble way, and he said, uh, let me take over for a while. Uh, because there's such injustice. I mean, God, in his way, the injustice and the resistance brings us closer to him. But in, in the, on the other regard, let me take over for a while. James took over for a while and he helped all his friends. He came back and he helped me. I came back and helped numerous people who were working with him and kept them on the show and did wonderful things. He gave us money when they syndicated uh, fifteen thousand dollars. He he gave certain uh, amount of people. Uh, uh, Add a boy, which you'll see in a many Saints in Newark. His his production company, Add a boy. It's it's in there. It's uh, I don't want to give anything away, but right. so I mean, um, this was a generous man, uh, a yeah. great man who who I had no agent. Uh, it's so hard to find an agent. I look at other actors and I say, wow, I feel bad because they're so good, but. It's just tough out here. And he really leveled the scales. He took over for a while. It was a limited time. You know, he really deserved to live his throughout his whole life because he's such a wonderful man. But what they say, God takes those, uh, the most important ones sometimes, you know. And, uh, and his legacy lives in all of us. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, and, and I try to send the elevator down for my friends. Jack Lemon, you say, send the elevator down for some people. Jimmy sent the elevator down. So I do the best I can with the limited uh, limited fulcrum that I have to help uh, those around me. Yeah, I mean, what a, I mean, what a blow that was. It was kind of one of those, you know, one of those moments, where were you moments when you heard about that and, and you heard about, you know, Jim and it, 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 it just kills you. You go, what? Yeah. He wasn't an old man. He wasn't sick. He wasn't, I mean, you know, but yeah, you're right. You know, you wonder why sometimes and, it's just you can you, you can sit there and wonder why for forever. And uh, yes. someone said something one time about um, 
God only gives you the light for a certain amount of time. And you can't spend the time in the light asking why. Yes. You just do it. Yes. You just do yeah. it. And you and you do it. Jim did it. Jim did it. I mean, big time. You guys are all doing it. Um, have you seen the new the new prequel? I like have, yes. Yes. What are your, without giving any spoilers, what are your thoughts? You, did, did, did you like it? Well, it's yes, it's it's an ambitious uh, effort. It's I mean, I, I, I see it being it's very ambitious to to do a to to, to work on a prequel prior to and, and to make it you know I, I, it, it runs to me like the Sopranos, you know, like the series, like a series of scenes and things that happen. And that's the way people ought to view it. Yeah. Not so much as a film with a beginning and middle and an end, as most films have that kind of crescendo. In Schindler's List, you have, you know, Schindler saving all those uh, Jewish people. And, and is that great scene at the end with the stones on the grave? Yep. You're not going to get that. What you're going to get, you're going to see Michael Gandolfini, who's wonderful. All the other actors who really play really well together. But you look at it as, as a whole, and they say that there might be some other ones also being made, being produced also to, to explain more. In that regard, it, it's, it's most excellent. Yes. Yeah, it's what's what I was watching when I was watching that podcast earlier today. A lot of the they had, they had most of the cast on as guests, and they said what's really hard is like they had Michael on Gandolfini, and they said you know you're playing your dad, and he said what was weird was you know Tony was a volatile, he would just snap, you know that's what Tony Soprano was. But back in this movie, you can't be like that because he wasn't that guy yet, right? So Michael had to figure out like how Tony Soprano would have been before all of that right so that's what i think that was probably super challenging for a lot of these people yeah i mean i think that we're born there are certain people i know from the children my children each one has a different personality of course Uh, some are sanguine a little bit more and then another one is a little bit more rebellious uh i think that see you'll see that in uh in young Tony that he's a bit more rebellious. He's a bit more anxious, um, to, uh, to have certain things. I think it, it definitely comes out. Michael definitely brings that out. And there, were, there is a scene, I think that you see that, um, that kind of brings those things out, but it's, it's not so, it's not so easy to, uh, as you say, uh, what forms a person, um, how a person is, is formed, but their nature, is usually pretty much intact, you know, how they yeah. are. And yeah. of course, then it takes circumstances and people, those are the matrix of the people around us that shape us. And in a way, the people around young Tony Soprano, Uncle Dickie, his dad, uh, little Silvio, Big Pussy, <laughs> Paul the Walnuts, you get to see them as young men um that shaped him in a way um and there is i i I could see that i could see that the similarities the traits not so easy to really to attempt to do because it's a film and you know it has multiple themes it has the issues of of the race riots in newark right it has the issues of young tony soprano um what to explain how he became who he became later on, which is hard to do in, in a film. Oh, it's real and hard, yeah. His dad, uh, that theme of the guys, uh, how they how they became. So it's as multiple themes, not so easy to do in an hour and a half or two hours. Yeah, it is. Well, it lends itself to a TV show, you know. Yeah, and and it's a super delicate thing because obviously there's soprano folk. Folklore, and I know that you still have David Chase doing this movie. So, I mean, if that anyone's going to direct it, that's this guy, right? So, you know, people are super anxious to see what how he's done it, and you got to do it correctly or right because you, you if you do a prequel, like we've seen, like in The Godfather Part Two, right? So that's the kind of the prequel to one. It's got to be done right, and some would argue that Godfather Two is better than Godfather One, right? Because you had all that background, and you know. But what's your thought on that? You like to, you like two better than one? 
Um, I can't say that I look at them as a whole. I, guess. I look at them as a whole piece. Two is as one is fantastic, and yeah. two is two is fantastic also. He was able to meld Robert De Niro, the young Vito Andalino. Uh, Coppola is a genius in that way that he was able to shoot in the same sort of form and meld the films with that same look. And of course, with the gravitas of how he became who he became, it was tremendous and really in a realistic manner. Um, in Godfather 3, from what I understand, that particular script was changed because Robert Duval was not given the amount of money that he wanted, which I thought was a stupid thing. I'd give Robert Duval any amount of money yeah. to Godfather 3, but that changed that script. And some actors were attached, like Winona Ryder, I heard was attached to it, but then they bailed out of it. And Sofia Coppola, who was, was, was a good actor, I think is a good actor, and um, I'm not so um, upset about her performance, but I'm, I would say that the script was not as good as probably the first one. I mean, yeah. who am I to say Coppola, you know, he's a genius, a wonderful man. I never met him, loved him. But I mean, th I think that it, 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 in itself, it was, it didn't meld with the first, the first two, but don't forget that it was a different, you know, they had to go in a different direction and, um, and that's what happened. But I do think you're right. The prequels are very important in, in that manner. Um, of telling uh, us uh, how people um, become. Uh, it's it's very um, ambitious to do such a thing. Yeah, uh, it's 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 a it's a it's a it's a high wire act doing prequels. Uh, and, unless you know you're the one that did the originals, then you know it's my story, it's my movie, whatever. I, I mean, it's 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 uh, it's tough, and it's like I said, it, yeah, you're right. It is a very very fine line. Uh, so what was, you, you grew up in Brooklyn. I did. I grew up in Brooklyn. The first part of my life was Brooklyn. And yeah. then I, um, when I became, came to Staten Island where, I, where I reside now, I was in junior, I was in, um, middle school, uh, the, uh, fifth grade. So I was 11 years old and, uh, fifth grade and, and, uh, Brooklyn is great. I just was there yesterday. Can't beat the food. No, the food well, is fantastic. The uh, the the calzones, the pizza, <laughs> and and the food is is wonderful. But Staten Island is it was wonderful in the sense that it was a little bit more suburban, and I had a chance to you know participate a little less amount of students per uh, square space. You might say, I was able to participate. A little bit more in activities. Yeah, so uh, I like that Staten Island, and it's, I do like the quiet also. Although well, I've lived in the city, but quiet is nice as you get older, I suppose. You know, with privacy. Did you? Did the acting bug bite you? When did it bite you? When? When, when did you go? This is. I, I kind of like. This is what I think I want to do. Well, growing up, um, yeah, my uncle Monsignor Joe Fanau, He was a Catholic priest became a, a Monsignor at, at the end of his career. He, uh, he raised money for Catholic charities. In his first parish, he raised money by, he was always a lover of musical theater. So he used to put on these musical shows, the Grecian play, as they called them. And he was in a parish in uh, Howard Beach, and you know, he did Funny Girl and uh, Hello, Dolly. And then he, as he progressed, he got his productions got bigger and bigger until they became really a big function of Catholic charities to raise money. Music Man, he did, and he had the, uh, the original composer came to see it uh, in, in uh, Queens, Christ the King Church in Queens. And I went to these productions with my dad, my family, and that's how I got the bug. Wow. You know, I auditioned for his play as a dancer, and I got in. But I had a crush <laughs> on one of the girls, and she decided to drop out. So when she <laughs> dropped out, so did I. <laughs> You ain't no dummy. <laughs> so, but he was a little disappointed at that. He wanted me to be in it. But later on, I, um, and you know, the funny thing is, he came to see me in a play in New York. I assist, I assistant directed a play uh, later on in my life. I went to, um, to uh, Pace University. I went there for business. I changed over to drama. I, my mom said, I told my mom, I hate this. Said, do what you want. And I said, okay, I'll do drama. I only finished one year. But, you know, 
when he passed away, God rest his soul, we went through his belongings and he had that original program from that first show that I, wow. that I, that I assistant directed. He kept it and meant so much to him, the theater. So that's how I got the bug through him. Wow. And then obviously, like we said, Sopranos was a huge break, but you did, but you did plays, right? You, you, you did yeah. plays. I mean, right. Growing up. Multiple plays. When yeah. I started doing theater, uh, I basically started opening up and doing plays, um, with Vincent Pastor and Maureen Van Zandt from The Sopranos. Yeah. Uh, uh, Maureen had a comp- has a company called Renegade Nation, and uh, she was a great uh, benefactor I, uh, and person and, and friend who uh, really gave me a chance to, to, to work on these wonderful plays that she wow. wanted to produce. Uh, I directed one, maybe directed two, uh, and, was in, and, and was in many of them. And uh, we're still working on some more. Uh, it hasn't ended, but COVID has kind of put a little bit of a damper on it uh, for now. But and Vincent Pastor is a lover of theater, and he's done off Broadway. He's on Broadway too. Sure. Um, and um, 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 so, I mean, the theater has been a really big part of my life. I love it because you can do roles that maybe you wouldn't be cast in um, in in other in the in the acting world of film and TV, and then you could show people what you could do. I'm working on one now currently that I want to put up in spring of 2022 called the OG Original Gangster. The original Gangster. Ex con gets out of jail and that's the premise, and he wants to make his life right by those around him and the people that he hurt. So I mean, theater yeah. is a big part of my life. I do love it. I, I'm going to see Hamilton this Wednesday. <laughs> you th- have you not seen it yet? On Broadway? No, I haven't seen it on Broadway. It's. I'm sure it's going to be. Ama- I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing here in Chicago. It's going to be amazing out there. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking it's forward gonna, to it. It's going to be amazing. Do you feel? Let me ask you this question. Do you feel like, in order to be a good actor, is being a director important? Like you can see it from that side of the camera, so you kind of know what it's like to be on the other side. Is that? Do you think that is that important? Well, not in, not in every case. I mean. Okay. James was never really, Gandolfini was never a director, but he was his own director and all actors are their own directors. Uh, if they're going to be any good, they're going to make choices and go with the choices. Now they can be guided by their coaches. Susan Aston was his coach sure. and she coached me also. Susan's a wonderful person and you get an outside a thought and they give you some, some in, introspect. But at the end of the day, you're your greatest director as an actor. You're trying things and it's coming from you and your actions are uh, very much like the truth and they're honest. Um, so I think all great actors and all are, are, are wonderful directors too. Yeah. They may not be a director in terms of the concept of a production and uh, be able to put things together like there's a separation there. Yeah. You see a lot of writers now, Paul Schrader, who wrote Mean Streets, has a, as a director uh, a film with about poker with Isaac. I forgot his name, Michael Isaac or Chris Isaac. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. writers have become directors. Sometimes that's good. Sometimes it's not as good because they hear it in a certain way, but it's through actions. The director knows it's actions. So, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a fine line. But I think all actors are, are great directors, too, with themselves, but not so much that but does it help? I think it does if you have that, that directorial kind of mind to try to uh, you get into traps, especially in TV and film, when you're saying things for the sake of making them sound right. Right. A lot of people get into those traps, but you're not living what you're doing. So uh, a lot of television gets like that. You know, I mean, I, I'm guilty of it sometimes, too. Maybe I'm your law and order as I said it the same way five times uh, and not really lived it the same way five times. But you really... If you're going to be any good, and James always used to tell me, you got to take chances. And he was always a guy to take chances. When we were in Scandinavia in, 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 uh, in, on an off day of streetcar, we went to the uh, Elsinore Castle, uh, Hamlet's Castle um, and, um, in Denmark. And we traveled through the castle and it went down to the lower bowels of the castle where they had the, the uh, dungeons and the torture chambers and uh, and James, uh, we came to one and the person, the guy told us, see this chamber, this was a torture chamber. How was a torture chamber? Well, they would put, it it looked like a triangle, uh, uh, like a perspective triangle, a a cave built like a triangle. 
and they told us and they showed us these boards that were triangular and the torture was to actually each day or each week close you in till you got to the very corner with the triangular the triangle the boards and that was it for you so we looked at that then the guy left and and jimmy looked at me and i looked at him wow it's something else said, hey, you want to go in what do you mean james go in Come on, let's go to that very, very corner where that where they were closed in. Jimmy, we're gonna get in trouble. They're gonna throw us out. Come on. He took up the uh, the rope. He said, "Come on, Bobby." He said, "You're crazy." I said, "Okay, I'll go with you." We went to that very, very little corner space, and we turned around. I said, "Holy shit, man!" As actors, you want to feel that experience. Yeah. Said, wow, man. And said, "Okay, let's get out of here." I said, "I said, it. It, okay, let's go." But that's the way he was. He would go to places. That's what made him so great. Yeah. You go to places that you think, well, I can't go there because they say I can't, I can't touch that. I can't. It's dangerous. Now he wanted to touch it. He wanted to feel the danger, and then and that's the way he was. That's what made him a great actor on Broadway and film and TV. And I thought that was a great moment in my life to be there with him. I wouldn't trade it for the world going into that corner of little dungeon space in Elsinore Castle. That's a great, that is a great, I've never heard that. So, I mean, obviously there's only a few people in the world that probably know that story and you're one of them. I mean, obviously, yeah. And I think, I think that is important. I mean, do you feel like as an actor, you push it a little bit, right? You, you, you know, I'm going to give you a little bit extra here. Well, the, you know, James Joseph, tell me if you if you're afraid to act with Paul Newman or Marlon Brando, whoever it is, Al Pacino, you should get out right now because wow. you know you get out of the business right now because you know you have to feel the, that you 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 have that. It is a bit competitive, and you have to feel the hate, like Matthew McConaughey. He has that thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. in a way, it is. It's uh, it is a little bit like that. You got to, yeah. yeah, I can do this. You know, I mean, I mean, you can tell yourself a million times. That, but you got to really go out and do it and, and take chances. And if you're going to be any good, you got to you got to take some chances. What a, what, a, what a career you've had. What, I mean, it's, I mean, yeah. obviously you're still I mean, it's still going. I mean, you're the career you've had so far is amazing. The stories. I mean, the the experiences that you've had, I mean, are, are absolutely I mean, it's almost one in a lifetime. I mean, a lot of people don't are never going to have what you had, man. And you're 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 so lucky, so blessed, and you've done such a great job. That's very nice of you, John, to say that. Yes, I I am blessed, and yes, and and I'm really very thankful that um, it's easy to get off track. It's easy to get bitter and, and to get anxious, and but it's, it's also a blessing to look back at things that you've accomplished and to, yeah. and to say, well, I've done that, and I'm going to continue to do my best to, uh, and what, what is it we do as actors? I, I think it's more or less the, uh, it's very ancient. It's, it's a very Greek, uh, how are we to live that question and to hold that mirror to society and, and to have that kind of, um, gravitas yeah. uh, to help people out. I mean, how many people had told me, after members only wow you know you, you know i was there where you were at and i just want to thank you for what you did because i realized that i was going in the wrong direction uh maybe some potential people who were thinking about committing suicide who didn't um i did get some calls after that so it's very important what we do it's very important i think what everyone does and uh, how everyone contributes because if you look at the great stories john they're not about they're really not about aristocrats there are some uh Patton, you know the general but the great stories i think are about regular men like schindler i don't think he was such an aristocrat I, I, and also about rockies um and uh and raging bull and, and you know and all those great stories um uh, about regular blue collar guys that overcome taxi driver, overcome um, uh, great obstacles and show how great they are. The humanity is, you know, so those stories are the stories I like to be a part of. Yeah. I mean, I, I can speak for myself. I'm, I'm very envious because as an actor, you're sort of a, a master of emotion, right? That's what you do. You, 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 you read something, you feel a kind of a character and you act it out better than 90% of the world. I can't do it. I'm just, so it's, it's a, I think it's a fantastic profession. I think it's, I think you're right. I think it's very, very important. And I think people can identify and you learn a lesson one way or the other with things that you have on screen. I think it's fantastic. 
Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, the thing is, I remember uh, uh, Marty uh, got into a little bit of trouble talking about uh, Marvel films. <laughs> he did. Versus his, versus his films. And it's true in a way. Uh, I mean, like when I went to see The Many Saints in Newark, I was uh, <laughs> there were explosions from the next theater. It's like it's very distracting. Yeah, oh, for sure. That's supposed to be coming from Captain America or Batman or something. Right. So, I mean, everything, uh, films are about escaping your world, getting in, and it's nothing yeah. like going to the theater. Some people are going to watch it on TV. It was a great feeling. And to tell folks, to try to go out and see Many Saints of Newark in, in the theaters because you, you get to see the art of, of what it is to make Alan Taylor, the director, how it is to make a film on a big screen because that's an art also, the form of itself. Yeah. But, these these shows, these uh, James Bond and stuff like that, they're very much different. I mean, the greatest I think the greatest things are the human stories, like Marty with Ernest Borgnine, Rod Steiger, the story of Marty, Patty Chayefsky's, those human stories of, of you know, wanting to have a girlfriend and you know wanting her to be a certain model type, and but then settling and then getting someone that you truly, perhaps is, you love and everything. It's more important at yeah. the end of the day. But I, you can't say that because you get in trouble. <laughs> well, yeah, you could you could think that. I could say that because I don't have I don't have the uh, like Marty. It's like <laughs> he's in trouble man, with that. You're safe. You could say that all you want. I could say that. Yeah. Um, I mean, listen, you've been so generous with I mean your time. I mean, it's we could, listen. You from Brooklyn? You from Chicago? When are you coming to Chicago? When's your next planned trip here? No, you don't have no plans. Right at Deep Dish Pizza, man. I say it's Go good. Play. Is it, is it as good as they say? You've never had one here? Never had. But, you know, they have the mock makeups over here. But I, I think they're <laughs> bullshit, man. They're bullshit. You know? All right. Pizza on me when you're in Chicago next. Okay. I'll be there. John, I'll look. Uh, well, I'll give you a call, man. You got it. You got to come out. It'd be, first of all, it'd be, it'd be great to, meet, to hang out with you, have a beer, have some yeah. pizza. It'd be fantastic. One of the things that I did like, and I heard it's closing down. Um, I don't know if it's true. Arlington Park, the racetrack. Yep, it's it's yep. In fact, earlier this or last week, last week the Chicago Bears just got um, they came with agreement for them to move there. Is that so? Wow. I mean, there's probably a hundred different things that have to fall through still, and it could be just sort of it could be a. Uh, you know, like a leverage point with the with where they're currently at, and if you don't like it, then I'll move, and maybe. But they've come to a deal in principle to move there. Wow! But how did that racetrack? Such a great racetrack, such a great turf course. That that stretch, that oh. that turf stretch, and I'm a bit of a racing fan. I I've won a few races because of that turf stretch. The horses get tired out, and you have to be a great jockey in order to uh, finish that race because of the, the stretch. It was such an exciting stretch run. Oh, yeah. And it was like the Cadillac of racetracks. Like you go there and you're like, they got everything here. And it was gorgeous. Well, what happened? What happened? Just, I, uh, just the funding. It went down. Yeah. It's just like, I think it was like a funding issue. And it was like, I can't afford it. I mean, I mean, right now I was, I was looking at the other day, you know, the bears sit on, I, I don't know. I don't quote I mean, something close. 24, 20 acres of land right now at Soldier Field. Arlington Park's 460 acres. Wow. I mean, think of what you can do with 420 additional acres, the parking. The, think of what you can do out there. And some they people. Did that, they did that with the Islanders here. Yes, uh, that's right. That park, but they've kept the racetrack, but they, they've created the stadium, which is up now. So. Well, and people say, like, I don't, you know, it's a hassle to get to Soldier Field in the city. I mean, it's a lot of traffic. Right. I mean, it's, you know, you go to Arlington Heights, which is a suburb of Chicago, and you got 460 acres. The parking's going to be you – know, so I think that's more attractive to some people. Will it go through? I, I don't know. I mean, the, city, right. the Chicago Park District and the city of Chicago don't really want that because you're taking a lot of money out of the city. Right. So they don't really want it. We'll see if it happens. There's probably a billion stipulations. I'm sure they'd have to get – followed through and crossed out, but they did come in principle to move. Um, so, but yeah, when, when you're here, you got to listen. I'll, it's, we got a couple of places. Go look up Lou Malnati's pizza. That's, that's where you got to start. What pizza? It's called Lou Malnati's. I'll be there with you, man. When I get out the deep dish, we can get it, whatever you want on it. It's, I'm telling you, if, if I could share your first Chicago deep dish with you, that's it. I don't well, know. I got a date, man. All right, on the podcast, I'm done with it. I don't care no more. That's what I want. All right, brother. <laughs>
Listen, tell everyone where you, what, what what you're doing, where they can find you. Give us what's going on with you. Um, um, it looks like I might be shooting um, a, a episodic series called For Nothing in uh, Buffalo, New York. And we started with uh, Michael Madsen is in it. Wow. New York Dogs. And I was told that we're going to try to complete the series. So I'm in nine episodes of that. As far as its distribution, I don't know where it's going to, what network it's going to go to. But I was told um, that that's happening. And then, of course, other than that, I have the play that I like to produce called The OG, yeah. written by Tom Kelly, sometime in the spring of 2022. I'd like for it to actually go from theater to film. I'm trying to take the same route that uh, a theater kind of thing is done and then people get together and say, wow, we really like to make it a film. Um, it's got a great premise about redemption and uh, kind of like the wrestler in a way, uh, Mickey Rock, but it's not the same as the wrestler, but it has that same sort of feeling, a father and a daughter estranged and getting back to, with my daughter. So that's called the OG. And uh, that, that's those two projects that I'm pretty solid um, on trying to do besides auditioning, which is not very much happening right now, for me at least. The auditions are really not coming in as like they used to. But hopefully, I think in 2022, it's going to come around a bit. Yeah, well, we hope so. Uh, listen, he's on Instagram at Robert underscore Fernero as well. He's got all of his dishes there. He eats really well. You got to check him out on there. Don't, 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 don't miss it. Listen, you've, I've been a fan. Now I've really become a fan. I'm like fanboy. I, would, I, I, I love it. Um, you know, now I get to call you a friend of mine. I, I, you know, it's it's yeah. it's fantastic. I, I cannot thank you enough for your time today, really. Thank you, John. It was really a pleasure speaking to you and, and the way you conducted your interview. We had a little rough road getting on here to the uh, Zen, Zen caster, but we, we did right. it. And, uh, it. It was a pleasure to work with you. And, and uh, yeah, really great job. Thank, thank you so much. Thank and you. I hope it's, a, hope it's a part two sometime soon, huh? I hope so. Yeah, let's go. Go. We'll try. Let's go get something together and we'll do it again. Let's sure. do it again. Bobby, thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. We appreciate it. Thank you, man. See you, buddy. See you, man. Bye. Bye.